Are you new to investing? Wondering whether or not you can self-manage your properties? Let us tell you about our partner, Rent Ready. Rent Ready is an awesome property management software that can help you grow and handle every aspect of your real estate investing business. Rent collection, tenant screening, maintenance, lease signing, listing. Honestly, Rent Ready has everything. One of the best features is their new tenant software, Latchel, where you're able to remove yourself as the landlord from being the middleman between tenants and maintenance calls. And it's also essentially a fraction of the cost of what you would pay for property management. Let me also mention that Rent Ready is unlimited. All their plans are flat priced. This means you can keep adding properties to your portfolio without having to pay more. You can close on all the properties you want and Rent Ready's price stays the same. Best part about it is for you guys is they've given us an amazing deal to pass on to all Weekly Juice listeners. You can get 50% off any Rent Ready plan at rentready.com when you use our code JUICEPOD. That's rentready.com, R-E-N-T-R-E-D-I.com with code JUICEPOD, J-U-I-C-E-P-O-D, and you'll get 50% off any plan. If this is your first time here, welcome. During our shows, we interview successful entrepreneurs and investors to spread knowledge, advice, and actionable tactics to help others in the pursuit of financial freedom. We discuss successes, failures, systems, motivations, experiences, and key lessons learned along the way in the hopes that these stories help you along your journey. Tune in every Wednesday to get your weekly juice. If you've been here before and like what you've been hearing, please subscribe, share with friends, rate and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. That goes an extremely long way for us. It's simple. Just click on your podcast app, type in our podcast name, The Weekly Juice, click on the reviews and let us know what you think. The more ratings we get, the more eyes we'll get on our show and in turn, we'll be able to provide you all with high quality guests. You can also find us on Instagram at Weekly Juice Pod for daily content and personal finance tips to assist in your journey towards financial freedom. Welcome back to the Weekly Juice, where we talk real estate, personal finance, financial independence, and entrepreneurship. Ryan and Corey here with another episode for you. Today, we have on special guest, Alex Camacho. He's a real estate investor, entrepreneur, coach, and mentor who primarily invests in the Southern California and Hawaii markets. He's done over just over just under 100 deals, um, over 19 years of real estate experience um, in the mortgage business, flipping business. Um, residential Airbnb. He's done it all. He's uh, yeah. Well-versed. How about his story, man? He was like uh, making like a couple hundred grand a year, which is a lot of money, right? And then went essentially. He said he like pretty much went broke after two thousand eight. Two thousand eight, the and then he kind of reinvented himself and took a liking to the mortgage business. But then he was like, ah, I don't know if I love it that much, and then got into uh, into flipping, flipping for others making some serious money, making other people some serious money. And then he's like, wait, I have a lot saved up. I can go do this myself. And that's exactly what he did. And now you're talking about a guy who's flipping in probably two of the, literally two of the hottest markets in the United States and consistently making, he said he made a million dollars in a year. Mm -hmm. He, um, it's important for people to listen to this episode because it shows that you can invest in these hot, hot markets. And, um, you know, it just, deals are out there and he shows us he's actually a master deal finder and he, he kind of walks us through running the numbers and where he finds deals and kind of how he sets up his system so i think for any beginner and intermediary this is uh is a great episode to listen to definitely talks us through all about how to find fund and specific uh like the niches of each deal so we should bring him in cool let's bring in alex alex officially welcome to the weekly juice we're stoked to have you on the show you've been you've come highly recommended. So we're thrilled to finally meet you. Thank you, fellas. I appreciate uh, you guys putting me on the show. I'm, I'm happy to discuss my journey and uh, talk about real estate investing. Cool. Um, can you give us a little brief background on you for those who don't know you, like who you are, where are you from, and then your story on how you got into real estate investing and entrepreneurship? Yeah, definitely. So um, I got into real estate investing about four years ago, um, but I did have some experience. So right out of high school, I got into banking uh, and it's kind of unrelated, but it, it is helpful when you get a financial kind of background within, you know, and I didn't have any experience like that in the past. So I was, I thought I was going to be a banker forever because it was a pretty good gig, you know, and um, you know, and, and then right around uh, the time that I was kind of thinking I was going to be a permanent banker, I got the opportunity to go into the mortgage business um, a little bit before the market crashed. I'm a little bit older. I'm in my thirties. So um, I started to, I jumped into the mortgage business, um, did really, really well. Um, I actually opened a mortgage company um, made great money for a couple of years and then the market crashed. And then pretty much I just lost everything because I didn't have any money management skills. I didn't have any mentors. I wasn't, you know, reading, I didn't have good habits. 
And I sold, slowly kind of lost it all from having like three properties, couple businesses, making you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to like being like broke back on my mom's couch, pretty much. And um, it was tough. Um, but what I always believed in myself. I felt like, hey, I can kind of climb back, you know, out of this hole. I dug myself in and I didn't think it would take that long. But then I found the mortgage side of the, or the real estate side of the business, which I felt fit me better than mortgage side. Um, so I started doing a bunch of short sales after the, you know, during the recession. And that's really where I got the real estate investing bug because I saw that the real estate investors that were buying these properties, flipping them, they were making like a hundred thousand dollars a deal. Now, granted, you can't get those type of returns as easily nowadays, but they were doing it because, you know, it was hard to get capital back then. But I just saw that what they were doing wasn't that difficult. Um, but I didn't take action for a couple of years. I started doing some Airbnb arbitrage. I you know, did some more of the, you know, the real estate stuff um, and just life got in the way. But I always had that in the back of my head that, hey, I think I could be a really good house flipper and investor and I would like to do that. Um, so about 2017, I was uh, transitioning out of like another mortgage related uh, role. And then um, I found bigger pockets, you know, the, the podcast. I, I uh, just decided at that point it was good for me to just go all in on real estate investing. So um, I went basically and just found uh, somebody on Craigslist, Craigslist that was hiring an inside salesperson and I took an entry level job. You know, um, I was making some money from the Airbnb units, but that's what helped me stay afloat um, during that time because I wasn't really making that much, but I was learning the ropes. You know, I was working for somebody that was doing exactly what I wanted to do. And so um, I worked for him for close to a year, um, you know, didn't make very much money, but I learned a lot, did about 14 deals, mainly just cold calling and door knocking, just pounding it, you know, um, because I had a lot of sales experience and a lot of real estate mortgage experience. So that helped out. And then um, about a year into that gig, I mean, I just felt like I had outgrown that position. Um, you know, mentors, sometimes they could have, you know, biases to like helping you out, but only under the context of the role that you work for them as. And so sure. I just decided to kind of move on from there. Um, and I got recruited by a much bigger company. I like to call them like a flip factory because they're flipping like over 150 properties annually in Southern California. And so I went to go work with them as a more of a acquisitions manager. The other guy was kind of just a telemarketer inside sales associate. And then, so I went to go work for this uh, other company and I had a much more expanded role. I had more support. And that's when I really turned it on and uh, worked, you know, day and night, seven days a week. I was just really hustling um, because I was glad to be in the game and, you know, operating with a company at a high level. And then I did, I did about 54 deals in that year and a half, along with about 14 with the other guy. So just in that first two and a half years, I worked on like, worked on like 65 investment deals. I learned a lot and saved, um, you know, close to a couple hundred thousand dollars. And then I just decided to go off and do it on my own. Um, close to about two years ago now, um, in August, September, it'll be two years. I, I went off on my own, started my own company. Um, now we've been doing about two deals a month. So worked on now close to a hundred deals in these four and a half years or so. And now I'm working to build my portfolio and kind of just really start to get to that next level. Great. Thank you for sharing that, Alex. I, I'm curious what it is about real estate investing that you clearly you took a liking to the, that type of business. You went from a smaller company to a bigger company and then went out on your own. What was it about real estate investing that kind of lit the fire for you, so to speak? Well, frankly, it was when I was at the agent and I was seeing them, uh, you know, make a hundred thousand deals. Like I just had to flip one house and make a hundred thousand dollars a month. And then, you know, I could, you know, make a million dollars a year. And, and in the mortgage business, I had already made, you know, 300,000 in my first year. So it was not my first year, but you know, at my best year. So it wasn't like I was trying to go back and be in real estate investing and make a couple hundred thousand. I was trying to go even bigger. And so that's what it stuck out to me that it seemed simple. It seemed doable. It seemed, you know, um, something that I could do within my skill set, within what I, you know, my resources. And so it was really just that, like, Hey, I, and I really liked the, oh, the win win part of it where, you know, usually buying an ugly distressed house, you're improving the neighborhood, you're improving the situation from the seller because usually they're in a better situation when they get out of that type of property. And then you got a new family or, you know, buyer coming in there. And then just, it just a win, win, win that I didn't really see in the mortgage business. I was just making money in the mortgage business, but this is something that I felt like I could just really wrap my hands around, you know, get passionate about, and it can make a lot of money. So it just, kind of hit all those things. That's why I got so interested in it. That's really cool. We, we talk a lot about buy and hold. And when we talk about flipping deals, it's, it's like you're buying yourself a job, right? You're going, you're going in and it takes a lot of time, money and effort to do these things, but you're talking big money in return, right? Like there's people, you do one deal. There's a lot of people that don't even touch hundred K and their base salary in a year. And you're doing that potentially you could do it in a couple of deals per year or right. Maybe it's two or three deals or one. So yeah, I think it's, yeah. It's incredible. And I think it's motivating for people to hear too. Like, wow, this is something like this is out there. Now, 
what skills and, and I guess qualities do you think it, people need to have to, in order to take this on, right? Like you specifically, I'm thinking about you and like, you're, it's very humbling to go from making, let's say 300,000 or, or over a hundred thousand and then starting back over and living on your mom's couch. And then also going to an entry level position. Like I, it's insane to change your lifestyle like that over and over. But the fact that you did it, you're the perfect story of like sharing that for people. Like, what do you think it takes to really get in and, and stick things out? Yeah. Well, I think it takes that sacrifice to look at it and say like, what, you know, do an inventory check of what are your best skills, your, you know, what, what you bring to the table uh, and what, you know, strategies resonate the most, most with you. Because for me, it was flipping. I didn't resonate with the wholesaling. I do want to see these properties transform. Um, I wasn't thinking of buy, buy and hold because, you know, I do get that sometimes, but like, well, why don't you have this huge portfolio or this and that? And, you know, flipping is a job. I'm not going to say it isn't, but it's a job I love, a job that I'm good at. And I don't fucking care what people think about, you know, this and that, you should have this, like, Hey, that's your opinion. You know, maybe I can have a couple more doors, but I mean, who, how many people can make a million dollars a year in real estate? Not a lot, you know? So that, that's kind of the way I look at it. But I think the most valuable skill um, that I, for myself, is a fit has been sales, negotiation, presentation, um, you know, analyzing, you know, property deal numbers. I mean, these are all the skills that you need to, you know, have in some way. And if you don't have it, then you need someone on your team needs to have it because, how are you going to get acquisitions on a consistent basis and get new deals if you're not good at sales or don't have a closer on your team? You know, you need a good negotiation constantly because you're negotiating with contractors, whether you're buying hold, you're negotiating with, you know, uh, contractors all the time as an investor. Um, and then also just this deal analysis, kind of constantly look at the numbers. I'm not a numbers person, but I know how important it is in my business. So I've gotten really good at analyzing numbers. Another skill is, is, running comps on MLS. Like there's a, there's a art and a, and a science to that. It's very, you know, there's a lot of different data points. And if you don't know how to read that, you can make big mistakes and lose money. So I think those would probably be the biggest ones. Oh, and then another huge one would be networking, networking with people to help you expand your network and to help you expand your, your mindset and to, you know, ask for help when you need it. The most successful people that I know are really good at asking for help, even though that they're very successful. And I think that's one of the reasons they are because they're not afraid to say, Hey, I don't know this, I need help here or how can I get help in this area of my business and my life? We want to get into talking about marketing and finding deals and like how you actually go about doing this, because that's, if you don't have a deal, it doesn't matter, right? Like you can't, you can be the smartest negotiator in the world, but if you don't have these deals coming in consistently, you don't have a lot. But before we get into that, I want to talk about your ability to invest in such a high priced market, right? You invest in Southern California and you invest in Hawaii. Those are known for two high priced markets. What do you say to the people that say, well, there's no deals around there. I can't actually find anything in these, in these markets. What's your, what are yeah, your words well, for that? I say, I mean, how many offers have you made or how many deals have you looked at? Um, I found that a lot of people uh, give up before they even try um, that. I was, you know, I was also somebody that thought that you couldn't get deals on MLS until I went out there, took the action and started finding deals on the MLS. So it's more of a matter of, I think of, it overthinking it. And I'm sure you guys know this and you have talked to a lot of people. We all overthink things. And then, and, and then it, when you actually take the actions, then, you know, from experience, whether what you thought was accurate or not. And so what I like to say is that uh, once you start taking action, your questions change because now you're basing off of new information rather than what you thought it was, you know, the theory of things. Right. And um, so like for the expensive markets, like there's low dollar price points in every market. Um, you know, for example, I, my business model is more of like, we're always trying to, our flips are always going to be at, at or below the, the median price from, for the area, the ARV. So if the ARV for the area, say half a million dollars, I'm trying to buy houses in that market for, you know, 300, $400,000 in that particular sub market of uh, Southern California. In other part, it's like the median price point of the Antelope Valley, another area that we, you know, do a lot of business in is about 300, 350. And so we try to buy stuff at two, two fifty in that range. So that way we're always at the median price point for that area. Um, so yeah, I'll just say that, you know, I bought a property last, you know, a year, year and a half ago for a hundred thousand dollars, a house in LA County. Now it was in the desert part of LA County, but there was still an hour and 15 minute drive from downtown LA. So there is still properties at low price points, but um, people just give up too quickly. They don't take the action. And then they're just, you know, drawing conclusions based off of a theory, not off of, you know, a real experience. Cool. Thanks. I think you talk, you touched on a lot and there's a lot to unpack here specifically with flips and finding deals and, and networking and, and just in general. Right. So 
I want, I know specifically you are awesome at finding deals and you mentioned running the numbers. And even though you're not a numbers guy, or maybe you weren't, you found that to be very important. I don't, I'm not a numbers guy. Corey's definitely more of a numbers guy than I am. So he does a lot of our analyzation, but you just feel so much more confident going into the room, knowing the numbers and like even talking about real estate in general. So can you talk about a, how you started running the numbers and maybe how that changed. And then what you realized, like, I guess, how do I put this? Like some, so a beginner can get, I guess you take the fear away a little bit, right? Like how, what can they do on a daily basis to start learning how to run the numbers so they can become a master um, deal analyzer? Yeah. Well, I mean, first I, I, they, I think they need to have some type of calculator, whether that be the bigger pockets, cal- you know, calculator, their own calculator, somebody to get from another investor. So they could just run their numbers on um, scenarios day in and day out. Um, I think, I, when I ran the numbers, I analyzed on average about a thousand properties a year. Um, these are properties that we're looking to make offers on. I don't make offer on all of them, but I mean, those are hundreds of properties every month that I'm looking at. So naturally you just get better and better at reviewing the numbers and quicker and quicker and you can make better decisions. Um, so I, I think it, it's just a matter of getting your own little system down. Um, it doesn't mean you have to make an offer, but you need to start getting better at tying up all your numbers because the numbers really dictate your action. The better the numbers, the more accurate the numbers, you know, I mean, the, the, the more accurate information that you could, you know, the more accurate offer uh, that you can craft. And so that's why I'm always like, you know, trying to, but any way we can button up our numbers and get better analyzing, we're, we're doing that because you just get this, like, you know, it's like, you know, that the 10,000 hour rule or what, you know, or just that mastery of, of something. And, and so uh, people look at, you know, a, a dozen deals and, you know, in a, in a couple of months and they and expect to get a deal like, and that's probably not going to happen, it, but who wants to sit there looking at listings, looking at pictures, looking at, you know, that day in and day out and not making any money. So that's what it comes down to is that people are just what expect, you know, the result, but then they're not willing to go through the process that gets to, to learn that mastery of, of what a real deal looks like. Because I say this sometimes that you either on uh, some opportunities, they, they might take, need five seconds of your time. They might need five minutes of your time. They need my five hours of your time. They might need a five days of your time because it, the, the deal is that juicy. So it just depends. And the quicker you can identify that because a lot of what we do is disqualification, right guys? Like uh, this doesn't fit our box. This doesn't fit our box. This is, Oh, wait a minute. This one does. Let me look at it. Oh no, there's a deal killer on that next, next, next. And then when you finally see something, you got to be able to pounce on that. Um, but you, you can't, you, you don't have the vision if you haven't looked at enough opportunities to be able to say, Hey, this one stands out. Yeah. Could you, yeah, I was going to say, can you walk us through like maybe what, what a good deal would maybe look like in your market? Maybe like check off a couple of those boxes for us at a high level, just so you could frame it for our audience. Yeah. Like what sure. you specifically look for. And then I know you, we, people never talk about this. Can you also talk about the deal killers too? That would take, say, Hey, I'm out. Yeah. So I think the first thing, for example, like, uh, this is also something that I'm not naturally good at. Back in the mortgage business days, my I have an identical twin brother. Shout out to my brother, George. He doesn't watch these things, but still. Shout he, out, George. <laughs> he started uh, memorizing all the zip codes in LA County. And I was like, bro, what do you need to, you know, to, he's like, because these zip codes don't change. Area codes change, other areas change, but zip codes don't. So if I plan on doing real estate for the foreseeable future, then I, I need to know like w- what zip code this is and what like pockets it encompasses. I'm like, oh, all right, cool. So when I started doing the real estate investing, I started noticing a similar pattern where I'm like, well, I, I'm looking at this zip code, but this zip, this zip code isn't as, the ARVs in this zip code are this much, the ARVs in this zip code are this much. So now I can eyeball stuff. So they tell me, I only need to know is the zip code, like the square footage and, and pretty much you know, the bedroom bathroom count and just the specs the you know, the basic details. And I could be within like, you know, 15, 20,000 of ARV and, and just be able to kind of, you know, again, razor slice it, you know, thin slice, it, I think it's called, and just not waste a lot of time on it. For example, if I get a single family house in LA County sent to me and it's under 400,000 and it's at least 1200 square feet, then it's probably a deal I should look at. Now, if it's in, um, like a, a Antelope Valley and it's under 250, same thing. So I already have these certain like metrics, same things with multifamily or small multifamily. Right now about $200 per door in LA County is a good deal. So um, if, if someone sends me a triplex and it's like 575,000, then I'm gonna jump all over that. If they send me a triplex and it's like 900,000, I'm probably gonna take a day to get back to them on that. So it, it just, you know, th- th- that's kind of a, an example of a couple there. And then a couple of deal killers, I would say is like murder, suicide is one of them. Like if I'm, you know, on, on MLS listing, it, it'll say that on the private remarks, Hey, you know, there was a murder, suicide or whatever. And those are usually, oh, that's a deal killer. If it's, um, 
in a war zone, war zone, like next to railroad tracks, it's really, really rough. Um, sometimes we just, you know, we don't want to deal with that, but with break-ins and all that, there's still rough, you know, really rough parts of LA. So we just won't, we won't go there. Um, some, oh yeah. And then there's like, for a multifamily, there's, you know, we're, California is a very tenant friendly state. So if they're like, the kiss of death is kind of like when you have a tenant in there that has been in there more than, you know, five years, it's part of the protected classes like disabled or elderly or, you know, a lot of minor children and they're paying significantly under market rent. Um, we just avoid those because those are the hardest people to relocate and or to work with because, you know, they either you can't get them out or you got to give them like 40, $50,000, some huge amount. So um, those would just be, I guess, a couple of examples of stuff that just, um, you Dude, know, killers. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I knew it was landlord or uh, tenant friendly, but that's crazy that that's what it comes down to in, in those specific areas. But I wasn't thinking deal killers. You actually meant murder, suicide, like actual yeah. killers. Like <laughs> I was expecting other things. That's pretty fun. Well, you mean just like, just the, just we'll, to talk we'll about buy, the area, right? Yeah. We'll buy the natural causes because that scares less people away on the back end. And remember we're flipping predominantly. So, you know, our end buyer pool, we were thinking about them. And if it's going to, you know, reduce the end buyer pool by like 60, 70% because of a murder suicide, then it's just really not worth it. So you mentioned that you, when you said these deals come to you or these deals are being sent to you or you find them certain ways, how, what's your strategy for finding these deals? Is it mailers? Is it cold calling? I mean, what's the way that you go about doing it, especially in a hot market in, in your, in your market? Yeah. So that's a great question. That's then that's a million dollar question. A lot of people ask me that. Um, I wish I had a better answer, but it, it mainly is, it's a mixed bag. And so for example, our, our you know, you, our last couple of deals, it's like a wholesale. Um, I got one from Instagram. I got one from, um, you know, doing this weekly webinar that we do. And then the tribe members are, or at least we, that's what we call them, our, our tribe members. They're going out there taking action. And then they send me the deal to, to joint venture uh, on. And then um, we're also, oh, we did direct, direct mail with deal machine driving for dollars in Hawaii. We got that deal there. Um, so we, we test a lot of things, but the thing is, is we have our core strategies of like MLS, um, networking and then also social media i'm very very active on social media so those are kind of the freebies and then we're, we're doing direct mail we're doing cold calling with a couple of vas and then we're also doing some text messaging haven't got any deals from text messaging or cold call lately but we're still doing it because you just never know we're gonna start and i'm a big fan of like internet leads i got a lot of deals last year from that not that many this year but we haven't been doing that many uh ads um, so like P Google PPC and, and those type of uh, methods. So I think um, what it comes down to is I think you didn't identify like the, the strategies, the acquisition strategies that best fit you and then, you know, get good at one or two of them and then start to add, you know, other strategies because if you got too many things going on once, you're not good at it. But with me having so many, you know, deals under my belt, I could train the team at the nuances of each acquisition strategy. And then we could just go lean to our strengths or our capacity, our bandwidth. That's kind of what, you know, our kind of business model works right now. We're mainly working on those kind of free strategies with some marketing. And then we're, we're just, you know, doing our own kind of uh, community. So then people where I'm like, what am I, what am I, um, the goal is to help create a lot of deal makers. I call them my deal makers. That's kind of my little catchphrase because it was very difficult for me to, to get this information. I felt like a lot of my mentors didn't want me to, you know, didn't want me to come up like I have. And so I feel like I wrestle this information out of people's hands and I'm trying to like give it away to people. The ones that are going to take action and those ones usually come back. Right. And then we work on deals together. So, you know, so it's really kind of a hybrid, but that that's on a high level. That's kind of how we're getting deals a, a mixed bag. Awesome. I have a couple for you, but specifically we have a lot, we always talk about buy and hold and a lot of people are, are comfortable with running the numbers and, and run analyzing deals on that side. Can you just dumb it down for us? And like a very elementary w walking us through, um, analyzing deals on, on the flipping side, like AI hey, hear ARV after repair value. Right. But like, what would someone look for? Say they did get a deal thrown their way in a DM or something like that and say, Hey, you should check this out. Like what would they even look for to say, Hey, would this potentially be a good deal for me to move forward? Yeah. So the main numbers you're looking for when it comes, I mean, and flipping buy and hold, I mean, a burr is really just a flip that you just refinance. So, I mean, you got to get a good deal and whether it's a burr or whether it's a flip. Um, but what, what you're doing is your first, what I, my default is usually looking on Google maps, just checking out to see if there's any immediate deal killers. Cause the last thing you want to do again is look, you know, go through the whole process and then, you know, it's next to some railroad tracks. It's a, it's a huge deal killer. And then you went, you know, analyzed for 10, 15 minutes and then, you know, you weren't able to disqualify it quick enough. So I kind of uh, do that. And then 
Uh, um, I just try to figure out the resale value, the ARV right away. And the kind of trying to like the barometer, where am I at? Am I at 450? Am I at 475? What is that kind of range? Because in our calculator, we have a base case, um, a worst case, and then a best case. So that way we're like, okay, this is the numbers that we feel pretty confident on. These are numbers if everything hits the fan and these are the numbers if everything goes our way and then we, you know, the market helps and whatnot. So that way we kind of have a range. And, and so um, we figure out the ARV. Once we figure out the resale price, we feel confident about that, or at least an initial desktop, re desktop review because you can't get it to every property. And then, and we try to be a little bit more optimistic on the initial kind of analysis because you haven't seen the property yet. So you don't want to be too pessimistic and not even be in the running or even be considered simply because you're being too conservative. You could always retract your, you know, or cancel your offer or modify your offer down the road. Well, that's unless it's a, it's a wholesale deal and you're you know going to put a non-refundable deposit, but you guys get where I'm going. And so you get the uh, ARV and then we have formulas to figure out rehab. So if you look at the pictures and we have, we usually go off of like 40, $50 per square foot in Hawaii, it's closer to 80 to hundred dollars per square foot. Um, it's crazy, but we go off this formula. And again, we're being a little bit more um, optimistic. And then we figure out kind of how long we think this is going to take based off our, you know, our past you know, performance. So is this going to take four months, five months? Usually our deals are four to six months. I don't do anything heavy unless it's a heavier discount or a better discount, mainly cosmetic entry level, you know, flipping is what we're doing. So we, we run the numbers on, on the rehab, the days held and the ARV, and then we have a minimum desired profit. So we know, Hey, for these type of deals, we, we want to make, you know, in our core LA, it's $50,000 minimum in, in the other part of LA, where it's lower price, we want to make 35 thousand minimum and so it, it hits the minimums and then it's optimistic that's what we're going to shoot off the offer so that's kind of a high level i mean it doesn't yeah. take us more than about 10 minutes to like analyze the deal and be able to shoot off a number sweet and now do you have did you build this calculator do you find it online or just so if someone wanted to find something like this Oh yeah. I have a private Facebook group. I can email it to you guys. You can email it to your, your people. I mean, it's pretty simple to use. I just fill it in. So I'm happy to share it. No problem. Yeah. Awesome. But we created, we created it based on um, what we felt we needed. And, and then it was based off of, of, of experience with the second company. So I kind of you know, use a little bit of their template and just kind of create my own. After a hundred deals. I mean, I think people would, would definitely take, uh, take advantage of it. So that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. I'm curious how, I guess the next phase of it, we're almost like walking through the phases of how you, what do you look for? How do you market? How does it, how, when it comes in and then like, how do you fund it? That would be the next question that we'd have. Like, how is it something that you automatically go to private money? Is it something that you fund yourself with the company? Just walk us through that, that uh, phase of the deal process. Yeah. So kind of like my, the rest of my business, it's, it's a bit of a hybrid, but the core strategy is that we take it down with hard money loan. I have a great hard money lender or a couple. Um, and then they ask for generally about 15, 20% down. And then I do a capital stack where I do a private money lender on the back end for some of the down payment, the gap funds. And, and that can range anywhere from 50 to hundred thousand based on the deal. Um, I usually always have some money in the deal because, you know, just to show people that, Hey, you know, I'm still doing it. Eventually I won't, but um, you know, right now, currently we'll do, we'll get a hard money first and then we'll get a private money second. And that did, you know, take some time to develop. I think a lot of people want to do that right away. Don't use your own money. Don't use your own credit and all that. But what I've found is usually you have to be a little bit more advanced to earn those type of, you know, opportunities and to be able to take deals down that way. Now I'm not saying you can't, um, I also do joint ventures where I'll find a great deal and maybe I'm running low on liquidity, not as much anymore because I got more private money, but um, there'll be times for whatever reason, I, I think the last one I did it on, I was a little bit short um, on having, I just, I like to have a certain amount of liquidity just, you know, for my own safety and for the company and for everybody, because we're doing multiple deals. We're, we're doing 10 right now. So I, I just want to have a minimum. And then, um, this deal has a heavy rehab, but it was a fantastic deal. It was projected to make a hundred thousand profit. And so like, I just did a joint venture with my, with, with my uh, broker. That's also somebody, he's an investor. He helps me list all my properties for a flat fee. Um, I refer him retail mortgage clients and he, you know, knocks it out the park. So it just, we got a hybrid of a kind of a relationship. And so I trusted him and I gave up 50% of the equity and I did a joint venture. So I do that on occasion, not as much anymore, but I highly recommend the joint venture structure. If you want to learn and a division of labor and then be able to, make more money. Um, I think it's a kind of a win-win as long as you kind of structure it right. 
I completely agree with you, Alex, on the the notion that you just said that like it's a little bit more of an advanced strategy. I think a lot of people look for real estate as like this way out of their nine to five job or way out of something they don't like doing. And they're saying, oh man, I can do this with no money or low money and and then find all these private money lenders. And I think it, the, the core of this, you need to understand finance, like your finances. If you don't have your finances in order, how are you going to manage that of all these other people, right? So I totally agree. And we're just getting into that realm of private money and hard money. And it's like, I'm so glad that our first you know, half dozen or, or so deals were with our own money. Cause now we understand how the process works and we understand like things that could go wrong, at least with the, we're doing some, some rehab work now too. So I, I, I exactly. It. And if I could just add a little to that, because so many people don't want to use their money and it's like, okay, well I work really hard so I can save my own money and be able to do it on my own. And I was proud, like, Oh yeah, I don't know. I don't work for anybody. Like I, I'm the boss, right? Like I'm the CEO. And then now that I'm like raising private money, I'm like, Oh, well, wait, I kind of work for these guys now. A little bit. Right. So, exactly. Uh, just, you know, don't be so quick to go raise money because then you, you know, you have to be judicious and responsible for that money as well. And if you haven't proven to do that yourself with your own money, then, I mean, I don't know if you want to be testing on other people's money just yet without, you know, first proving it to yourself that you can do it and not lose money. So on the, the private money and the hard money. So I just want to walk you through We're we're currently doing a, a rehab and we're using a home style loan. So it was 15% down. They funded the rehab and the property, which is great. Um, but now we're like, okay, we, we have to do another one of these coming up in August. And we're debating, we're like, okay, do we just run it back with another home style loan and have to put 15% down, which is Honestly, we're coming, we're starting to find out that's not a lot to put down and it's a pretty damn good deal because you mentioning this too, like, Hey, if you go out and you find a hard money lender, you you're going to have to put 20% down anyways, and you're probably going to have a higher interest rate. That's what I'm gathering. Yeah. Can you maybe explain to, to us or like walk us through a couple of deals, like a uh, uh, private money or hard money deals where you don't put money down? Like maybe someone comes as, as an equity partner and like, do they stay on for like two, three years? I'm just so intrigued on the different types of deals that are out there and what you can do in playing with money when you get other people to come in with you. I, I'm you, you meant joint, yeah. mentioned joint so ventures. One would be this like Maui deal that I just closed on. Like I literally have no money in the deal and I'm a 50% equity partner on a $1.35 million property. Now, again, that's more advanced because of my track record and then moving to Hawaii and then having the network of people with cash and money and the desire to do deals in Hawaii over there. But um, the way I structured it was I found the deal um, once I found a deal, I tied it up and I locked it up and put it in an escrow. I had to put $20,000 deposit to lock this deal up. I had 10 day inspection period. And then during that time, I just shot out to my network. Um, I tried to wholesale it. You know, we locked it up at 1.35. I tried to wholesale it for one, four, five. So we can make a hundred thousand dollar wholesale fee. ARV is about one, seven, one, eight, to like two, 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 three, just depending on what you do to it, because it's, you know, it's a 3,300 square foot house with this amazing view in South Maui. Wow. So a lot of upside. Yeah. And then, um, so by sending out to my network, this one buyer kept on rising to the top and he actually flew out. And then, um, you know, he wanted to do a you know, wanted to maybe buy it for himself as a primary residence. And then when he got there, he just saw it a little bit more as like an investment deal. And so in, in escrow, I negotiated because I knew that the seller was open to doing seller finance, but I didn't want that to kill the deal. So that's why I locked it up first. And then, and then I, in, in escrow, I negotiated seller finance that like I wanted. Um, he had a $400,000, like, uh, a hard money loan coming due. So we had to pay that off and give him 200. So 600 down, he was going to hold a note for 750. It negotiated at 6% on a three-year balloon note. So then that way, you know, he knew that we're going to probably end up flipping it and we're inheriting tenants. So we had to relocate them. So it was kind of, again, a bit of a hybrid situation where we got this guy and he, and my, my JV partner had a couple million dollars liquid too, since he was just retired. So he's just like, okay, well, um, I want to do the deal with you. We'll do, you know, JV. 50-50, uh, your boots on the ground. You're the ones going to do everything and I'm just going to put up the money. And then um, hopefully we could do another deal in the future on Maui and maybe you can find me something for me to live over there. Uh, I'm like, cool. So then it just ended up fitting because I negotiated a good deal and then the buyer, it just fit the situation and I wasn't able to get the wholesale I wanted, but then I was able to retain the property and retain 50% equity. So I, wow. like I said, theoretically, when we, when we closed, I got my $20,000 deposit back. So theoretically, I have no money in the deal. I'm a 50% equity partner. I have a joint venture notarized agreement with my equity partner saying like, hey, this is the roles and goals. This is our responsibilities, uh, each one. And everything's pretty clear. Um, that's it. You know, I'm no money in the deal, but I mean, I, it's projected to make like two to three hundred thousand dollars. 
Wow. So I mean, you have the ability to do that deal because of your experience and putting up your own money and, and, and having skin in the game for so long and people trusting you that you don't need to have it in for this deal. So I, I really like that. I think that's kind of a, a future thing for people to look at and not to say that you can't get into real estate investing without your own money, because you st- certainly can. If, if some ha- one has done it, then some people can do it. But I, I always, we always say like, I just think it's, it's good to have your own uh, skin in the game first. Well, it teaches you the ropes and you're super careful and, and a little bit more conservative when it's in your own cash. You know how much time it took you to get that cash and you don't want to blow it and on your first deal. Right. And then you're done, you know, like yeah. your, your brain might switch off. You're not completely done, but if you, if you do lose it all, you might not want to go back and do it again. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, we always go, or we have in the beginning, like we're going back and forth and we just, we're trying to, to ease our way into the private money game, but it's seeming like we have this kind of like, decent hybrid model right now where we can do another home style loan where I, I don't really want to give up equity yet. You know, it, it's we If we can, if we can afford it right now, like let's not give it up because down the line, maybe we buy a 10, 10 unit or an apartment complex. And that's at the time where like, then you, you find the deal, right. You maybe do the 50, 50, like you did find a JV to jump in with you. Um, yeah. And I mean, again, sometimes people don't really have to do that. And I mean, like uh, with the other stuff, I, I try to avoid that now, but I think it's a good like strategy to get started. And if you find a great deal and you want to learn, I mean, it's a great way to get started, but then eventually, like you're saying, we are living, leaving a lot of money on the table. So it's better for you to raise the private money. Cool. What do you think the, I'm just curious about the, the future of the, in the, I would say the markets in California and in Hawaii, they're so hot, so, so hot right now. And I don't mean to change the subject completely, but I think we were just like, just, you know, off the top of my head, I was thinking like, do you foresee this continuing and continuing to be a really hot market? And you just seem like you've had enough experience in the game to like, maybe get a feel for it. Nobody really knows. Right. But like, what are your thoughts on, I've, I'm hearing things in Maui. It's just like in even hotter than than SoCal. And like, that's from what I've heard besides maybe Austin, Texas, like the hottest uh, real estate market in just terms, in terms of prices. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, um, the way I look at it is we just keep a very close eye on, you know, supply and demand inventory. So we're checking inventory every single day. Uh, another thing that we're doing is you keep in mind, since our model revolves around like entry level stuff, we're in and out. I mean, it's unlikely that the market completely radically changes in like a matter of four to six months. Cause you know, we're keeping a close eye on things. And then um, I think you just you got to keep a close eye on interest rates because interest rates have uh, such a big impact on the affordability and, you know, people's, you know, appetites to, to, to borrow money and to buy property and all that. So, um, so number one, I just, we just keep a close eye on everything. Um, I, I'm, I'm seeing the returns um, right now on my properties. Like the, 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 we're getting a lot more than we're expecting on these properties, but that doesn't mean that we're being reckless when we're analyzing new deals either because, um, I just don't want to over leverage and then be in a situation where things change, you know, like on a dime. Cause you know, I was there in 2007, things changed really fast within a matter of less than a year, like six, eight months, things just hit the fan. So we can't rule that out completely either. And that's why like, I don't really take on heavier rehabs unless it's a deeper discount. So, you know, if we're, we're going to get a 50, 60% of ARV, then we'll take down a heavier rehab. Now uh, all, everything else, we're, you know, we're going to probably still be around that 70%, 75% max if it's a super light rehab. Cool. Yeah. So you've done, let's just call it a hundred deals, just about, um, over your course, your investing career. Can you walk us through your most lucrative deal or the one with that? You just, you, your biggest home run or maybe grand slam deal just to, just to motivate some aspiring investors that may just be a little scared to jump in the game. And maybe this will motiv- motivate them to jump in where they can make a, a big hit. Yeah, dude, I got a perfect one for this one because um, we were just talking about this earlier, right? Where, you know, you want to use other people's money before you use yours. Well, I was using kind of technically other people's money for two and a half years, right? I was working for people, getting them deals of their money. They were, they were taking them down. And then I saved enough money for me to do my own deals. So right as I ended up leaving that company, I had two deals kind of basically shoved in front of me because I started doing marketing PPC and Google and they were both amazing deals. So I went from like basically maybe having twenty, thirty thousand dollars, where I ended up saving like a bunch of money um, during that time, and then I had like you know I don't know, I think close to two hundred, and then I literally had to shove like almost all that money back into the pot to take those other two two deals down, and it was really really scary because I you know I had worked really, almost three years to get that money, and then like now I had to like almost put all my chips in and then have like 20, 30,000 again after doing all that. So <laughs> yeah, we are literally thinking about the same thing that's yeah. going on right now. We just closed a couple of weeks ago and we have another one lined up. And we're like, wow, we just, 
we're going to be right back in just the same just gutted system. it replenished <laughs> yeah. it got it replenished that cycle man and that's why you get it that's why we're like trying to find these private money lenders yeah, like exactly. hey, it's, <laughs> you think it's going to get easier but i tell people it's not going to get easier you just got to get better i mean yeah. it's just what it is right and then um so i ended up getting this deal um i know the area really really well because i grew up down the street i thought this would be a perfect primary residence or perfect you know uh something I could add on to ADU or, you know, add a second unit and it had a lot of upside potential, but the lady wanted like $45,000 more than what I wanted to pay her as a flip. I think the ARV was around 700. I had to pick up around 500. She wanted like 545. Uh, but then I had been toying with the idea of doing subject to, you know, buying the property and then taking over the payments because that way I don't have to get a hard money loan. That way I don't have to pay points. And so I pitched it to her and she said, yes, and I didn't even know how to do it. I just had heard about it and I had pitched it to a couple of people. And so when she said, yes, I just had my poker face. I'm like, all right, great. Well, I'll get the paperwork set up and then I'll be back tomorrow or the day after and we'll figure it out. And I get on the phone, I call my title rep. Like, yo, what is this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, I got to figure this out. And then um, sure enough, yeah, I was able to do the deal. I took it down. Um, she had a, like a $2,000 mortgage payment because Back when I had uh, been in the, uh, the, uh, the short sale business, you know, I'd done a lot of short sales. I had gotten good at getting on the phone with lenders, finding out the details of the loan, all that stuff. And so I did that and I found out she had like a 3% fixed rate. Uh, she had one of those Obama, Obama mods. We, uh, during the Obama administration, they gave away a bunch of like really good loan modifications. So I was like, hey, this is a great, you know, subject to, she said yes, and she has great loan terms. So I, I, I basically negotiated with her, gave her the 46,000 that she wanted in cash. She signed it over. We did the deal. Um, I rehabbed the property and moved in as my primary residence. I lived in it for about 18 months, but I had low mortgage payments. So I did Airbnb on the two bedrooms in the front because it was like a four bedroom, two bath house with a detached garage. I converted the detached garage, which was already kind of a storage space into a kick-ass office. I mean, this thing was like state of the art. Nobody knew that was my office. You know, all my social media, everybody thought I had a legit office, but it was in my house, in my garage. And then um, I pretty much rolled that out for a year and a half rehabbed it. And then I sold it for tax free, a profit of over a hundred thousand dollars. And I lived basically for free for like that, you know, that year and a half. And then I built my business and then I sold the property and then cashed out. So like, I mean, it, it was a deal I would have passed on. And because I used this creative strategy and, and, and did all that, I was able to turn like what I say, you know, uh, you, you know, a um, loser deal into a home run, basically being, being creative. Wow. I love that. And it go, it just kind of goes to, I don't know the quote and I'm, I'm, bad with remembering exact quotes, but it's, it's just not say somebody famous. It might've been them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fake it to make it, but like when you get an opportunity, you just say yes. And then you figure it out. Right. Like that, that's really what it, what it comes down to. Ready, fire, aim, ready, fire. Yeah. There that you kind of thing. Something yeah. Like that. Yeah. yeah. So can you, can you just walk us through elementary style? Like what a subject to is like, I I'm grasping it, but like you mentioned, you only have to pay this woman 45,000 bucks. And then you took over everything. Can you just like, Baby step it for a beginner on here. Us. Yeah. So one of the things about um, properties and doing deals like this that are creative is that you, what, what a subject to deal is when you take over the existing mortgage payment, but they still have the financial responsibility. And so they're signing over the title of the property. Um, you're making the payments for them. Um, and you have an agreement in place that you're going to do this for X amount of years, like two years, three years, five years. And you usually do this in scenarios where there's equity, but not a lot of equity or very little equity. And so um, it is, to me, what I consider is just another tool in your investor's tool belt that you need to have. And as you grow as an investor, this is something you should add because there are those scenarios that people come up where like for her, she, was, she wasn't she was behind, but she was about to go behind. She had equity, but not a ton. And the property was not a complete like teardown, but it did need some work. So it just kind of fit into that. And she had a very specific number she wanted. And then, you know, we had a couple of meetings so that, that it's trust on both sides. Like you gotta be able to trust this person not to you know be a crazy person because you know, you're you kind of like still connected a little bit. You, you know, they, they still have financial responsibility to the property. So, um, and then, they got to trust you to make the payments as well. So there, I think that's very important. And then um, I believe, uh, all, at least in California, all you really need is to transfer the deed and then an uninsured affidavit of deed from a different notary. And then you just have to keep the insurance policy in place that she had before and then just maybe do another insurance policy in just your name. So, you know, there's a couple of little things like that that you need to do. And I did it and I got it done. Um, but there was that issue that came up where I felt uneasy because I couldn't reach her anymore. And if she filed for bankruptcy, she has that mortgage in there. There could be some like, kind of some issues down the road. So it isn't something that at least I, 
I recommend that you try to do like long-term, like 10 years. It's just like something you could do to three to five years. Although there is people that do it for long-term. I'm just saying it is kind of a little bit more of a short-term, uh, short to medium-term uh, term, uh, strategy, as I understand it, as when it's best used. Alex, when you say um, financial responsibility, does that mean that the, I guess she's a, Technically, a tenant, right? Of yours, is she responsible? No, she, well, she for- was going to give me. It was going to be vacant. And it was, she would close that escrow. She was going to give me the possession of the property. But I mean, like, uh, she still. If I don't make those mortgage payments and she doesn't make them, her credit is going to get messed up. So she's Got still it. liable. Uh, there is this thing called a due on sale clause. Um, people need to know about. It means that at the minute the title of that property. Uh, transfers to somebody else, then theoretically they, they could call the loan due. So then you have to, you know, sell it or ref, uh, refinance or something. Um, but uh, that's something that it just, it just, it varies. I've never seen it done. And none of my title reps have ever seen it done because as long as you're making the mortgage payment on time, um, then generally that's what they want to see. Uh, but it can't happen. And I, I just talked to a lot of people and no one I've ever talked to has actually had that happen to them where they, they did a subject to deal. And then the, the loan was called due by the lender. As long we were, as you do it right, you should be okay. Generally. We, it's funny. We were just talking about that today because we were trying, we're debating down the line, dropping the, our properties into our LLC. Right. And so the position comes up is like, well, they can call your loan due if you, if you transfer the title over. Right. So, Everyone keeps warning us against it, but they've not, not one has an example of someone actually calling it due. Right. Cause if you're, if your financial house is in order and you keep making these payments, why would they, why would they want to call it due? I mean, aside from yeah. just because they can, they can get the cash. Yeah. So, but then the, we also had the question is like, well, can't you just refinance out of it? So like, if they do call the loan due, can't you just jump to another, um, yeah. And another- that was always in the back of my mind, like, Hey, worst case scenario, I'm gonna sell this property. I have equity. Or I'm going to refinance, but because it was such a low rate, um, I mean, rates weren't as low back then, you know, this was almost two years ago when I did it. And then, um, you know, so it, it was just like a matter of like, this thing fits. And, but uh, like I mentioned earlier, I think it's a little bit more short to medium term and, and long term. I think it's a little bit harder. Cool. Um, last one for you before we get to towards the end of the show is, um, I know you, you knew a bunch of flips, right. And you have, you have a job, but you love it right now. We talked about pre, before the show started that you're going to you know, slowly transition a little bit and pick up a couple more rentals. Do you have a, like a set number of where you want your business to be or like how many rentals, how much cash flow? I guess you need passively to just kind of chill a little bit. So you don't have to feel the, the weight of all these flips. Yeah, of course. So, uh, my goal is, to, is, uh, my passive income goal is $20,000 a month. Um, I think I can get there somewhere in the next 18 months to 24 months. So, um, you know, this year is really about transitioning to like buying a lot more passive um, because I've worked at this point. I'm using my money now. People trust me enough to use their money and I have a system. I have a team. So now it, because I always my desire was always to build a company, a real estate investing company. And that way, like all my you know team, people that work with me have opportunities. Um, and it's not just all about me because I could easily just go and just flip a couple houses a year, make good money, travel around, right. and, you know, not really have to do much more, but you know, I want to grow. Uh, I want to make an impact. So this year is really about, um, I want to buy an apartment building this year, uh, like a 10 unit, at least, um, in Southern California. Um, and then that will help me offset some of my, you know, my income, um, with the flipping and then start to, uh, you know, bring in more passive income. So every year after, you know, this year is really just going to be like more passive, 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 get to that 20 mark. And then we'll see, we'll go from there. Um, you know, there's people out there that want to be billionaires and hundred millionaires. You know, I, I, I just want to, you know, have enough passive income to eventually not have to ever work again and just do this game for the love, you know? Yeah. And do what you want when you want. Right. Yep. Um, That's our whole goal too. You mentioned a lot throughout the show, team members and, and building a team in this ecosystem, right? That you're putting together, which I absolutely love. And I don't want to go too, too in depth on this, but can you just talk about for our beginners here, like who maybe the the five most important members of your team are and like how you can, how you can build a team. People get so scared when they're like, oh, I actually have to go talk to someone. And, and what do you mean have build a team? Like, I can't just do this thing on my own. What would you tell them? Well, I think first of all, you need to be a good follower to then be a good leader. So as you've seen, I went and followed those people. It was hard because I was making them a lot of money. The first guy I worked for, I estimated made him three quarters of a million dollars in 11 months. You know, the other person I estimated, or the other company I worked for, I made approximately 1.2 to 1.4 million before then in 18 months. So like, I mean, you got to be able to get, you know, to 
to be a good follower than to be a good leader. So I think there's that. And then there's also like this fact that people want to be in the game, but you got to have a high standard because this is a difficult business. So I think you got to be an A player to attract A players. Last year or a year and a half ago, when I first started my company, I was just accepting kind of, you know, okay people, just people that, you know, wanted to work with me, but they weren't A players. And so we didn't get A player results, right? We weren't getting the wins that a championship level team was getting. So I think you really got to be an A player and attract the right people to you. And so um, I have a high standard. I, I want people that have the desire, have that have the work that they that, that have good communication, that, that have good strong moral compass. So I, I think it's uh, first be that team member that you want to track is number one. And then after that um, is you know, social media has helped me a lot attract a lot of valuable team members to me because my top team member right now I would say is Will. He's my you know acquisitions director slash COO integrator. Um, and he came to me and was kind of a mentee, um, but he was a rock star. And I just, he kept coming back with just better and better questions. And then when I got the opportunity to move to Hawaii, um, I basically would say, Hey, I need you to replace me in LA. What do you feel about that? We'll review your contract every year. I know you're an A player. If you want to stay forever, uh, if you want to stay longer, we'll talk about that. If you want to move off on your own, then we could talk about that too, because, you know, I left another you know, company. I would have stayed longer if they would have you know done some things. So I want to have those conversations with my people that I didn't get when I was working for other mentors. So I'd say that, and then so will is a big one. I attracted them through social media and just, I like mentoring people and helping people get into the game as long as they're taking action and they're good people. And then um, I think just, understanding what you bring to the table so you can double down what you bring to the table and continue to work on that and start to add pieces in it. And, and, and investing usually it's around a couple of roles. It's like admin acquisitions and rehab, at least with flipping. So like, I'm not good at admin and I'm not good at rehab. So I just focus on acquisitions and then I, you know, I hired around the rest. So the next hire was a virtual assistant for admin. I got a rock star doing that. Um, so I would say that's another top team member. And then um, another acquisitions director, Alex Ibarra in my Hawaii organization, same thing. He found me through social media. He was you know, bugging me for a couple of months to like start doing deals in Hawaii. I wasn't ready yet because I was getting everything, all the systems and processes down for LA. And then just starting to get used to living in Hawaii, which was different, amazing, but different. And then, um, so I would say those are probably the top three that come to my mind because, you know, they, they, they bring in the revenue and then they're, you know, they're replacing me on what I was good at, which is the acquisition side, which I've always leaned towards, you know, if you get consistent, great deals, then everything else kind of figures itself out. That's kind of my mindset about things. I love that because it's, it's a game of leverage, not only in the actual investing, but in the game of leverage in the people that, you know, because you Alex, you may be really, really, really good at this, but you cannot do it all yourself. You couldn't be at the place that you are now without this incredible team. Right. And that's right. like, that's the most important thing is you learn it, you learn how to do it yourself, and then you can outsource it to other people. So, and now you're talking about running this real estate business. Like people need to learn the basic steps of building a team, just like going through a regular deal, right? Like just finding a lender, finding, um, finding an insurance broker, a title agent, like a, a construct, uh, what are they, a contractor, like just the little, like the baby people around or to build your little team. Then, then you can go on to the next level and start building, um, an actual company. So, I think that's, that's huge to bring up. Very yeah. cool. The last segment of, well, not the last segment, the second to last segment of our show is called the core four. And we get to know you a little bit more personally. I know that you mentioned that you're an investor or, or a, a mentor and a coach too. So we can certainly talk about that here. But the first question we have is what is your favorite investing or flipping book? Well, wow, that's a tough one because I, I read a lot of books. Uh, my favorite of all time is the the classic real estate investor, the millionaire real estate investor by Gary Keller. It's so dense. I mean, there it is a little bit older, but it's it's such a classic. Um, so I would I would probably start there. I also I'm also a big fan of Howard Marks. He's an um, he's a dead investor out of Wall Street, but he has a, a couple of great books. So anything by Howard Marks for for investing in general, um, I would say that those are probably my top. Yeah. Cool. Um, you also mentioned two earlier on the show that I just don't want to skip over, uh, rocket fuel. And then there was one other one. Do you remember what it was? Traction. Uh, traction, yeah. the traction is like a, it's it'll just call it the operating manual for entrepreneurs fits very well for real estate investing and wholesaling. And then rocket fuel is, is kind of the follow up to that. Once you've read traction, then you want to read, uh, and uh, ro traction is very dense and deep, but then like rocket fuel is an easier read. So that's how I would, I would, I would first read traction and then, um, read, uh, rock a few afterwards. Awesome. Thank you. Number two is what's the biggest mistake you've made along your investing journey and how have you learned from it? 
That's great. Well, I think the going back to the team thing, I think my biggest mistake was just uh, settling for average team members. Like mediocre, mediocrity is is contagious, and it, we got mediocre results. And then I was, uh, you know, I'm an A player, so I'm like, I don't, I'm with B players or C players, and it just didn't work out. And then once I raised my standards there, um, because I learned from my mistakes, because because you know, we weren't getting results. Um, things start to work again because they're more coachable. They, they execute better. Um, you know, they motivate me more, even though I don't really need a lot of motivation. So um, you just you, one A player is worth like five B players. Like it's, it's just insane how much of the difference is. So I would say that was my biggest mistake, just not having a high enough standard for the people that I work with. I couldn't agree more. I, I um, manage a sales team and we go through this all the time. It's like, I would much rather have one or two A players and, and the rest like B, C, but to rather than having all five B players on the, on the team, because those two A players will uplift everyone else. And like, if you're not, if you're watching what they're doing and you're not trying a little bit harder, like then you're gone pretty much, you know what I mean? So it's just interesting. I, I think of myself as an A player too. And it's, it's hard to motivate some people, right? And some people just, no matter what you do, they just, they're just going to stay in their, in their lane and they're not going to emulate what you do. And no matter, and it, then all the time, money and energy you put into it, it just, it kind of goes to waste because you're like, I could have just hired an A player and just got rid of someone. So <laughs> yeah. um, I think about that all the time. Yeah. Very cool. The third question of our core four is you kind of gave some, some of your team um, members and how valuable they were to you, but we'll go with this one. Who is your who for, for this year? And by meeting this person, you feel that your business or life will be elevated to the next level. So that can be somebody that you haven't met, or you can mention somebody that you have met that's helped you get to this place. Uh, in your life now? Well, a great friend of mine that I'm actually on, uh, I wouldn't call it a vacation because it's really my lifestyle. I'm like in Mexico right now. Um, and so his name is Jay Martin Thomas. He's a passive investor and he's influenced me a lot about being able to, to manage my business from a distance and be remote and be able to travel the world. Um, so he's been a huge influence on me. Um, so I would say that he's the one that comes to mind, maybe because I'm hanging out with him. We're just having an amazing time here in Mexico. Um, but, you know, I also hung out with him in October and he helped me kind of get some things set up as I was moving over to Hawaii and going to be, you know, managing my, my LA operation remotely. And now we're kind of reconvening like seven months later and both of our lives are completely different in a much better way. The ability to take your business from something that you're really good at, that you do really well, and then separate yourself out of it. Well, I mean, we're not at that stage yet, but I can imagine that that is like the ultimate. He's the puppeteer. Yeah. Like the awesome. way that you can take yourself and separate and then teach everyone else to do it the way that you did it. That's uh, not a lot, not much better than that. When a system starts working efficiently, there's like not much better of a feeling when you're just like, what? it's, it's giving the results you would, you would have previously seen if you put all the effort in yourself, but when you watch others do it and it's something you created, like I can't even, it's probably just mind blowing. Yeah. It's absolutely amazing. I love seeing them win and then, you know, seeing them perform and you know, this deal that we just got accepted offer on, like it was the first virtual deal that we did. I did nothing except like approve the numbers and, you know, kind of send the wire. That's all I did. And it's like, it's, it's, it's doing very well and everybody's happy, but um, yeah, it proves that now they can go out there and fish. And then, you know, what I'm teaching them works. So it's like a total win-win and just a boost of morale of the team, but everybody just has to be aligned where, you know, they know they have to pay their dues. And, you know, I, I've worked close to five years really really hard in addition to the other things i've done to be where i'm at so yeah some days it feels too good to be true but too good to be true but the other days i'm like no i paid my fucking dues and i worked really really hard and i earned this so you know cool yes, sir couldn't agree more i'm we're in the grind phase right now so <laughs> no, we're, we're, in, we're, we're catching in. a couple of years um, <laughs> you get, you get so there, question number four is um it's a little bit deeper and just help us get to know you a little bit our listeners what do you want your legacy to be like why are you doing all this well, I want my legacy be that I want people to know that they, they can transform their lives and I want to help impact other people to transform their lives. Like I have mine through real estate investing. I think it's something that everybody can wrap their hands around. It's, you know, it's the universality of real estate is something that is meaningful to me. It affects all of us, whether you're renting, you're buying, you own rentals, you don't own rentals, you own a bunch of rentals. Like we're all affected by real estate. So I want my legacy to be where um, I've helped, you know, hundreds of people you know, maybe even thousands of people improve and transform their life through real estate investing like I have. Wonderful. It's a great answer. You officially made it to the last segment of the show called the last drop. And the question is knowing what you know now, Alex, what would you, what advice would you give your younger self? You said you were in your thirties. Maybe you go back to, I don't know, 15, 20 year old Alex. 
I would have started a lot sooner uh, in real estate investing. <laughs> Everyone says that. <laughs> yeah. But I just would have started sooner. I think I would have been, you know, happier. I've been a lot more, you know, a lot more wealthy. And I just think that it's, uh, you got to pay attention to your passions. You got to pay attention to things that fire you up. And, you know, real estate always fired me up. So I think I procrastinated from like 2014 to 2017. And I could have just went all in back then and it would have been good, but it is what it is. I just think, um, if I would recommend, I would have talked to my younger self, I'm like, Hey man, you're really passionate about real estate. You should just continue, find a way to, you know, work in real estate full time. And I would eventually find my way to investing inside of real estate because it, it just fired me up way more than mortgage business, but I kind of ignored it for a couple of years. And, um, those years could have, you know, kind of helped me ramp up, you know, and, and, and whatnot. So I think people need to pay attention to their, you know, that calling that, that fire in them that, 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 you know, they know they're really passionate about, and then, you know, they can uh, figure out the rest, but they got to work on the, you know, that because you can build off of that a lot more than just eh, I'm making money. It only goes so far when you're making money doing something. You got you got to have some type of liking and, you know, passion is overused, but just some type of inclination uh, something where like, Hey, this is something that I'm very interested in. And then, you know, you can build off of that. Yeah. They both have a lot to say about that. That's like the whole reason we started the show. It's like kind of takes us back a little. So we lived together for uh, right after college and, and it's, I just remember our days coming home from our jobs and we're just like, you just had a day, right. And you're just sitting there and you're like, you're working for someone else. You're helping their, them out with their dreams, but you also are like trying to figure it out. Like not everyone knows. You know, we were early twenties then too. So we had no clue what we were doing. Yeah. You're like, Oh, I just want to buy this car. And then you're like, Oh, the, this this guy owns the house that I live in. He's renting to me. He's kind of like kind of a loser. Like, like, honestly, I'm like like I don't. It just seems like he didn't have it all together. I'm like, am I? I think I could do this if I wanted to. And so we started cracking heads on it, and just we're like, yeah, well, you know, one day we'll start doing this. And um, then I started at the same time started researching financial independence. I'm like, wow, I should probably get a Roth IRA. And I was like, all right, I'll sign up for the 401k at my job. And I talked about this in a previous episode, but then like five years later or four years later, whatever it was, like I still hadn't started it. And I like knew I just wasted those four years of compounding investing. And then he and I could have, we could have found the money for the down payment on a house sooner. Like, you know what I mean? You always go back to the time you're like, dude, it really, it was hard. It seemed hard, but until you do it. And then it's like, once you get, it's more so just the fear, I think. Right. And then once you get yeah. over and you do, you're like, yeah, it was, that we're really wasn't that bad. What we were saying earlier, we were overthinking things and like you guys could have started sooner. I could have started sooner. That's why I'm big on pushing people to take action because you got to just get started. And then once you do, you're going to figure it out. Like I did with that one deal that I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And then I figured it out. I didn't think you can get deals on MLS. And then I figured it out and started getting deals on MLS. So you just got to, that's why we push people to, you know, go take action because then you, you'll know whether you're capable of doing this or not. Otherwise you're going to be, you know, years are going to pass by. I totally agree. And you just said earlier in the episode that your questions start to change and your fears start to change. And like the things that scared me even six months ago, don't scare me anymore. It's like, wow. Once this action starts, it's really like this, this big snowball. So you got to move up your timeline. I think because humans are so good at adapting and stretching and like figuring it out. Like when think about when you're back in school and you had a test in a week, you're like, eh, all right, no worries. I'll study like maybe like three days before. And then you get to the last day. This is at least me. You get to the last day. I'm like, Oh shit, I have my test tomorrow. And you cram it all in and you still ace that shit. And you're like, dude, I could have done this. Like this applies to everything in my entire life. It's like, just give me, if I give myself a deadline of tomorrow or, or two days from down the line, I can get something done that is going to take me six months to get done because I'm giving myself six months. I think about that all the time is like, we really need to like, it's take action, but like really like put it on paper and just say, no, I'm going to get it done in a week. Like, this will be done. Like where we're talking about like rolling out coaching and, and courses and things is like, all right. Yeah. Like we have, we have X, Y, Z coming up. We get this rehab. Let's push that. We'll start it. We'll start it in August. Nope. Dude, we could literally have this thing rolled out next week if we forced it. So yeah. Yeah. very cool. I don't know. I just kind of, no, that I had was, to say it out loud for me to actually do it. That so. was perfect. So now we have this recorded, so we have to go back and actually do it. But, uh, Hey man, I, we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I know you're on vacation, so we want you to enjoy that vacation, but uh, we had a blast. So thanks again. Yeah. Yeah, man. I had a blast. You guys are great interviewers. I'm, I'm sure you guys are going to knock out the park. And I mean, anything I can do for you guys in SoCal or Hawaii, let me know. Um, and Thank you. Get after it. I, uh, I truly appreciate it. I, I didn't dive into it on the show, but I've been to Kauai. I, I do have to make a trip to the other island. So I will de definitely be hitting you up. Come, but check also out. Come check me out on Maui, bro. I got you. I appreciate you. I definitely yeah. will. I'll bring this guy on yeah. if he's good. Um, <laughs> but for people that enjoyed the show and they want to get to know you a little bit more, I know you do have an episode on bigger pox as well. So we'll have them. We'll plug that. Um, can you just let people know where to find you and how they can network with you? Yeah. So the easiest way to find me is on Instagram. I'm very active there. Um, so it's Alex Camacho TV. 
That's A L E X C A M A C H O T V. And just send me a DM there and then we'll get back to you. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to help um, new, new investors or seasoned investors or local investors to my markets any way I can. Thank you so much. Perfect. It's been a pleasure.